Okay, hi. Uh, we're back to talk a little bit about eel again. And uh, if you missed our previous uh, little talk about eel and why eel has, uh, is, is listed as critically endangered, please go ahead and have a look at that at our YouTube channels and other channels where it's available. So last time I mentioned that we would come back to uh, the matter of uh, the impacts of the eel and the eel stock and what we should do about it, basically. Uh, so I have some numbers here, and when it comes to eel, numbers are tricky, uh, to say the least, because it's uh, hard uh, for scientists to compile and get the relevant data uh, that we need um, uh, to assess you know, the, both the status of the stock, but also impacts and also the, the issues that connect to uh, the problem of eel, the decline of eel. But these are some numbers that I've added up here on the board uh, that come from a, a Danish study uh, that was presented this year, uh, trying to assess the different impacts and, and how big impacts fisheries of certain kinds would have, for example, on eel. So uh, I'll take you through this uh, just to give you the general overview. But regardless of, of the, the, the perfect data, which we'll never have, I think the general uh, division here is, uh, is uh, fair uh, and, and reasonable. So, impacts on eel. Yes, of course, uh, we still, uh, although it is a critically endangered species, we fish for eel. So we have uh, a, a variation of eel fishing around the EU, but summing them up in basically the commercial part and the recreational part, uh, we, we have roughly these numbers. Now, it's important to note that the commercial fishing is both on adult eels, bigger eels like this, uh, really cool looking fish. Uh, they can sometimes be as thick as my arm, but also, you know, roughly that size even be, be, to be called an adult. Uh, it depends on if it's male or female and so on. So uh, a large chunk of this is, is adult eels, but also, and this number is again assumed, uh, assumed uh, uh, data on, on um, what the glass eel fishery would result in if it if it did not take place basically so we're talking now about the this tiny small eels that reach our shores here in europe after the spawning and they've spent maybe one or they have spent up to two years out there at sea and now drifting to our shores it's we call them glass eels. so uh roughly um uh, half of this is adult eels and half of it is is uh, glass eel fishery. And again, the glass eel fishery then is, is an estimation or the effects of the glass eel on the consequent or eventual adult eels is calculated in this study and sums up the number to roughly 45% or 44% is the, the total take of eel of various life stages. And then we have recreational fishery. Now, recreational fishing uh, usually uh, is on the adult eels, the bigger eels, and this can take place anywhere from basically the sea, coast, estuaries, lagoons, all the way upstream, all the way to really far away or distant lakes, far away from the ocean. Uh, this number in particular is, is uh, well, it's listed as 7% of the total, but uh, I would say, and it's also stated in multiple uh, studies and also by ICES, that this is likely a, a, an underestimate because we really don't have these numbers. There are indications of certain countries having a rather vast uh, recreational fishery for you. So uh, clearly, this, if, if this is in any way an overestimate, this is clearly an underestimate. Then we have what is listed here to be simple as other. So other, there are parts in here that are anthropogenic mortality, meaning that it's mortality that we have caused somehow. Most of this uh, is related to migration barriers and hydropower uh, or dams or other things that simply hinder the eel either to reach where they want to go uh, upstream or hinder the eel or kill them as they go downstream. Now this is, depending on the river you look at or, or area you look at, this is uh, the hydropower, for example, is a substantial uh, mortality for eel. Um, uh, and then also within this group here, other, we also have what's called natural mortality. I mean, basically predators or, or I mean, pre predation on eels, uh, other species, such as cormorants or other birds or other fish that eat eel. 
uh, also take a, a chunk of the stock. Of course, it's natural. But summing the numbers up, we get to a, a rough division of slightly above half uh, of, uh, of the uh, eel stock is affected by, uh, the outmigrating eels are affected by fishery or stake uh, in fishery of some kind and other anthropogenic uh, mortalities plus natural predation is roughly a uh, half as well. So this will give you a, a rough indication of, of where we need to go or what we can change. Uh, uh, we humans need us. Uh, and uh, together, I mean, both nationally and together in the EU, what we need to address. Uh, so what I will now just talk a little bit about is the, whatever the potential measures are and, and I think more importantly, the priorities because we need to prioritize and we need to do things fast. As I said last time, you know, the eel's life cycle is so long that things we do it today affects the eel population potentially 20, 30 years from now. So we, what we did 30 years ago is what we see the results of today. So it, it, in the case of eel, it's tricky compared to other, other species. But okay, so we're, first of all, I'm just going to talk about the, the fishing part. Um, and I'm going to talk first, actually, about this one. Recreational fishing. So we have here a critically endangered species. We have known that the eel has been in a critical state since very long now. Uh, the scientists have been calling for basically a zero mortality for soon to be 20 years. Now to allow for a recreational, for recreation fun, basically, a fishing on a critically endangered species, we simply cannot find a valid argument for. Uh, there are all kinds of arguments presented out there that I, I consider them and we consider them being not valid, actually. Uh, we have some countries that have actually taken this uh, uh, full out, uh, full out and, and banned that recreational fishing. But there are far more that simply haven't. And this one is something that should be handled with priority. I mean, uh, even, uh, or not even, angler groups um, uh, uh, throughout the EU are quite positive to this, and they have been since long. So this should simply be done. We should phase this out with urgency. Now, going to the commercial part then. Okay, so like I said, roughly half of that number is the adult eels, uh, the eels that are just about to, or in the very close uh, future, become part uh, of, of the spawning stock. Now, again, as priorities go, going back to what I said earlier and last time of the long life cycle and how far the eel has come to actually reach the level of maturity that it can go spawning, priorities in our measures need to target uh, adult eels. I mean, they're the ones that now are getting ready to, or, or as we speak, are swimming uh, through the ocean to get to the spawning grounds. We, we simply cannot you know, lose focus on, on, uh, on the fact that we need to maximize the amount of adult spawners. So the, cover, the fishing of the, uh, the, uh, both recreational and the commercial uh, that targets adult eels really needs to be addressed. Uh, we do not see it possible, basically, to build a business model a commercial fishery on a critically endangered species. It is very hard to understand why this should be okay for eels when we talk about other fish species and trying to reach a sustainable or maximum sustainable yield or good environmental status. But in this case, the eel is so far below all those known levels or status or, or okay levels, whatever you want to use, that an active fishing on it is just it's almost incomprehensible compared to why, why is eel not given the same rights as a cod or a haddock or a place where we have very clear restrictions on how much we can fish and that we need to have it at a certain level. For eel, this doesn't apply, it seems. So the commercial part of the adult eels and the recreational part, both should be phased out under the current circumstances. Going back to that glass eel fishery, yeah, that should also be phased out. We shouldn't have uh, you know, targeting on, on the, the juveniles either. Uh, but as priorities go again, like I said, we need, to, we need to do things in the right order and make sure we maximize the potential effect uh, of our measures 
here and now to increase the spawning and to increase the incoming glass seals. So if we do that and then we get more glass seal, then to have a glass seal fishery even to increase that is again completely uh, unacceptable, of course. So the glass seal fishery is not by in any way, uh, should not in any way be sort of forget, forgotten or not be targeted, but, but uh, uh, to prioritize is important here. So we have the adult eel fishery, we have the glass eel fishery, and we have the recreational fishery. These needs to be phased out. Now, part of the glass eel fishery is today also a part of the recovery plans or the, uh, uh, the measures many member states have taken to support an increased uh, uh, eel stock. Meaning that they take wild eels from somewhere and they move them to somewhere else for them to grow and then become spawners and migrate out. Uh, even though we were to phase out or ban a fishery, that could still be allowed via derogation for conservation purposes, not for, for, for you know, an active taking as uh, for food, uh, but rather than as a conservation measure. That could be done. So that would be then the, the, the sort of the fourth step. We target the adult deals, we phase out the commercial fishery and the recreational fishery. Uh, and we look at the glass eel fishery from a very specific point of view of conservation and not uh, for cons to, to consume, basically. Uh, now, uh, the other part, again, here would be the, uh, also an important priority, and again, looking at adult eels. The eels migrate through the river systems as they mature, and they want to you know, reach the sea and the sargasso. Why they do that is again something we don't know about, and anyone voluntarily wanting to swim 6,000 uh, 6, kilometers is strange enough, but uh, eels are cool, so that's one. Uh, here we know today that there are quite simple measures that you can take at certain uh, uh, barriers, such as hydropower dams, by creating basically uh, uh, sloped uh, racks with steel grids or, or graphite uh, material grids that are uh, uh, slow sloping either upwards or to the side. It can direct eels to, uh, to escape hatches uh, to get them to pass the uh, hydropower dams of the station. This has been proven effective, effective up to even 100%. Uh, yes, it is expensive. Yes, it is a complicated process, but it can be done and it has been done. This should be, of course, also prioritized. But uh, to do that and to pay that money to improve the downstream uh, migration and at the same time allow both a commercial and a recreational fishery on those eels downstream of that plant is simply just strange. The costs adding up to what an eventual eel downstream a system when we have first paid for relocation of an eel from France or UK up to somewhere in the German waters for it to live there for 20 years, then we you know, pay for mitigation measures at several dams to get it downstream and then for it to be caught again. The actual price of that yield is, is probably rather astronomical. I've tried to do some calculations on that and it, it turns out to be quite, quite high. So this also regarding the hydropower and the mitigation needs to be taken into account and needs to be done with a much more uh, you know, a strict timeline and um, uh, and pushed through basically by member states. And it's very simple from our point of view to call upon the ones that own the dams to pay for it. They are the ones basically responsible for killing a lot of eel. They should have to pay for it. It's not nothing strange. As fishermen sort of have to pay for reducing or facing out the fishery, this would be the equivalent. But like I said, to not to, to mitigate and, and spend huge amounts of money on mitigation measures here and at the same time have an active fishery is kind of uh, a strange approach. So going back again to the prioritize, we need to focus on the adult eels, making sure that the spawners, the ma we maximize the amount of spawners that are uh, you know, uh, swimming out of our systems here in Europe. Uh, we need to focus on um, the commercial fishery on all life stages. Uh, I mean, both the small, medium and big or large adult eels, the same for recreational. And from our point of view, there is simply no reason to separate between water body A, C or B. 
because it doesn't for the eel it doesn't matter so if it's in the sea coast lagoon or river it doesn't matter fishing needs to be phased out across the board there is simply no other way of doing it and it would be unfair extremely unfair to only target a certain area and not this area so when we talk about commercial and recreational fishing and phasing it out we mean everywhere so uh, these are some of the numbers that I've said uh, that are assumptions, they are difficult to get to, I know that, but like I said, I think these uh, basic uh, sort of larger entities of, of roughly half and half are, are, are uh, relevant and true enough for us to use. The one thing I haven't said anything about, which I'll just say something briefly about, is what is then hidden in here called natural predation. This is quite often something that comes up um, uh, both uh, you know uh, agencies or scientists and, and fishermen and anglers that constantly bring this up uh, as an important uh, impact on the stock and it is of course but it is a it is a natural impact it's something that all fish experience I mean cods eat other cods for example or a certain type of predator fish eats plenty of other fish species this is something that occurs naturally so uh, yes, if this becomes uh, a, a larger number than any of the above, yeah, that would be, first of all, very strange, but of course, yeah, maybe something we need to look at because the stock is so depleted. Uh, but yet, to focus on that or to, to basically uh, uh, call for, uh, for extensive management of other animals or other predators is a strange priority um, compared to what we can affect and should affect. Uh, or should uh, should act on, um, and we normally do for fish species. We manage our activities. We set fishing targets for other species. Uh, that's what we do. Natural predation is always there in calculations of, of a stock assessment, of course. But we need to be careful not to focus on the wrong things, uh, at least uh, uh, with priority. Focusing on that uh, would be a very odd choice. So. Final word, next year we will have a review uh, or an evaluation, there is an ongoing evaluation of the EU eel recovery plan. Now, a lot of, a lot of uh, things I mentioned uh, last time and uh, also pointed to here regarding the impacts has sort of been aimed uh, to be addressed by this current plan from 2007. Now we've had that plan since 2007 and, and we haven't really seen any strong effect plan. Um, we think and we hope <clears throat> that, uh, that the EU member states will see this as well and, uh, and understand the urgency of, of actually reviewing and changing that plan uh, and uh, setting, setting new targets for ourselves to improve the situation. There are many sort of pitfalls or problems in this plan and, and that has sort of uh, become quite clear in the past you know, decade. <clears throat> and, and, and uh, uh, there are plenty of uh, detailed issues that needs to be addressed. But one of the key ones, I think, uh, is that we have been playing eel management as a national issue. So one country has been doing measures over here and another one next to it has been doing maybe different or similar measures, but they haven't really coordinated the measures, which has meant, <clears throat> and again, going back to the fishing and the impacts, we have basically been trying to increase the amount of, of spawners by relocating eels or by mitigating hydropower uh, or other dams trying to get eels to pass through but we have at the same time sustained and kept the fishery uh, and this is a dual control that is simply just strange again strange to have in a recovery plan this needs to be clarified and done much better we also have this very strange situation where a country a and b up here uh, have done measures to increase the out-migrating silvery eel, for example, to go towards the Sargasso Sea. But over here, we have two member states fishing for the same eels. Again, non-coordinated measures in this way is simply a, a, a strange way of, of uh, designing a, a, a recovery plan. So that, that is one crucial element that must be vastly improved in the next year's uh, revision of the eel plan, the international coordination of this, and to see eel as what it is it's a it's a global trotter and i mean it's a it doesn't really care about what country it lives in and there's only one single stock of eel never forget it there's just one stock one type of european eel on the planet and 
the responsibility is not national. We need to see it as an international responsibility. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, please go ahead and check out the other video regarding e that I, uh, we made a couple of uh, days ago. As usual, any questions, thoughts, ideas on this video or regarding the amazing fish of Eve, uh, let us know. We'll try to answer. Bye, guys.